all know fires can happen at any time, but during October, Fire Prevention Month, we pay special attention. One of the hidden treasures of Bristol is the Bristol Firefighters Museum. It's a collection of firefighter history by Hap Barnes. And if you keep watching and you're a Bristol resident, you may qualify for a free smoke alarm. We'll talk about that later. The Bristol Firefighters Museum is truly a gift of love for the city. It's located on the second floor of the New England Carousel Museum. So this is Kathy Mitchell who knows a lot about the Bristol Firefighters Museum and it really has a lot of history going way back and, and some serious Bristol uh, complications and fires, right? That's correct, that's correct. Uh, we have photographs from back into the late 1800s up till the 1980s uh, and what's kind of interesting about the photographs is that uh, sometimes when we have people come in, they'll look at a picture and say, uh, is that Uncle John? And they'll look close and say, yes, that's Uncle John. You know, he worked from 1941 to 1961 at right. the Bristol Fire Department and uh, the different apparatus and how it advanced through the years from the horse drawn to actual trucks and the pictures are magnificent. Do we know any of the major fires that are on this wall? Uh, this particular one right here is uh, a Union Street fire, which I personally remember, and that's from 1988. And how that started was uh, they were renovating and they were using tar paper mm -hmm. and someone was grilling and uh, a spark came and that tar paper just went up. And thankfully, I mean, it displaced a lot of people, but no one got hurt. Yeah, no, you can always replace buildings. That's so. right, that's right. A lot of great memorabilia on this wall with axes. I mean, this, if you had to say fire department, if you didn't have the truck, the axes and all of that really are, are some. What, tell me about these hats if you can. They're called parade hats. And uh, when there was a parade, the firemen would use them with their dress up uniforms. And of course the hoses, uh, you know, these were used for, um, they would be put in a lake for, uh, and the water drained from the lake for a fire. <laughs> Come a long way. Yes, it has. And this, this was uh, one of the probably one of the first, uh, I guess, longer distance hoses. Yes, this is a water cannon that was on the back of a fire truck, and of course, it moves every which way. Attach the hoses here, and on the other side of the uh, museum is a uh, fire cannon that was used in the New York Harbor on a boat. So again, the the hose would be put in the water and hooked up and pumped through there from the actual Hudson River or wherever it happened to be. I'll tell you one thing, Kathy, that strikes me about the museum is, is it really kind of gives you a history of how far we've come in fighting fires. Like, you know, this is the way it used to be. What, what is all of this? This is actually from the early 19th century equipment that they use. Some was horse drawn, some was, uh, some of the pieces were uh, steam, which mm -hmm. they used coal or wood to fire up the steam engines. But this piece here is quite interesting. As you can see, it's a ladder. And if you look way up at the top, it's a hook. Now back in the late 1800s, that was known as a hook and ladder. Right, well, we didn't have the big trucks with the, with the sky cranes and the, the large ladders. So, I mean, I always wondered where that term came from. What they did actually with this ladder and hook is they would sit on the edge of a windowsill as depicted in this picture, and they would hook that hook onto the second story and climb up. And then again, unhook it, go to the third floor, and that was their hook and ladder back in the late 1800s. You know, it's dangerous to fight fires now with all the modern equipment. You can only imagine if somebody had to, you know, hang out of a window to fight a fire. Exactly. You, you'd have to have pretty good courage. Exactly, exactly. You know, Kathy, I, I think this says everything in a nutshell, the evolution of kind of how far we've come, this display of all the different trucks. You have your old fashioned from the late 1800s right up to, I'm going to say in the 80s, 90s, 2000. I mean, they're a little more modern than this particular one, but it gives a, a good history of the fire right. trucks. The interesting thing with all this technology, it's still the basics like smoke alarms that still prevent fires. Let's talk about how you might be able to get a free smoke alarm if you're a Bristol resident. From the past to the future, Bristol firefighters answered the call last year almost 2,400 times and fought 256 fires. The best way to battle a fire is to prevent it. Each October, fire crews routinely make the rounds to our schools, giving tours and tips on how to prevent fires. 
This year it's even better because Bristol has received a federal grant to give and install smoke and CO2 alarms to qualifying Bristol residents. Well, I think everybody since their school days knows that October is Fire Prevention Month and I'm here with Bristol Fire Chief Jay Kolakowski and even though we should be safe all year round, we kind of take time in October to make sure that we're safe and this one's kind of special, right. isn't it, Chief, because Bristol residents may be able to get a free smoke alarm. That's true, Mark. Uh, we've, we're about six months into a two-year program that is funded by a FEMA grant that we received uh, late last year that will possibly give uh, up or at least three smoke detectors and CO detectors to residents of one or two family homes in the city of Bristol. That sounds good. So how does somebody qualify for these uh, smoke alarms? Uh, the basic qualification is, like I said, a one and two family home within the city of Bristol. Most of them have to be built prior to 1986. And at 1986 is when the uh, building code changed in the state of Connecticut to require hardwired smoke detectors in those homes. Now, give us the process, because this is really unique, because the homeowner really calls, qualifies, and then your guys take over. So take us through that whole process. It's as easy as it could possibly be. Uh, you do call um, our fire prevention division and speak with our assistant, Kim. And that number uh, is 584-7964, extension number four. Uh, you speak with her anywhere between the hours of 10 and 2, usually. And what she does is ask you a couple quick questions, make sure you qualify for the program, and then she gives that uh, homeowner's or tenant's information to one of the local firehouses in the area, and they'll be contacted by that firehouse and set up an appointment for an installation. Okay, so your crew gets to the house. What happens after that? So once the appointment is established, that company comes out to their home and they introduce themselves to the homeowner. They go through the house a little bit. The company officer usually explains the whole process to them again, the program to them again. They have them sign a waiver or release it for the Bristol Fire Department. And then what they do is they do a little walk through the house and they establish where the best locations for the smoke detectors and CO detectors will be. While they're doing this, they also do a, a, a courtesy home safety check, not just for fire safety, but for general safety in the home too, and point out any, any good points that the people are, are right. uh, following as far as fire safety, but also anything that might be deficient and they could correct uh, very easily and make them safer. All right, Justin, one of the things we go through is the kitchen. We point out any obvious fire safety hazards we come across and just safety items in general. This thing catches my eye right away. It's over the burner. So you want to keep this far away from the stove. Okay, something else we noticed, Justin, on our walkthrough. Um, if you do use this as a wood-burning appliance, we want to make sure you keep your furniture at least three feet away and anything else combustible, too. So, like, all of these things um, we try and find a place for and move this out of the way somewhere, too, okay, while we're using it. Not a safe place to keep it. Now these are really advanced uh, smoke and uh, CO2, uh, you know, alarms. I mean, what? Explain a little bit about where you would have uh, just a plain smoke alarm uh, con converse to maybe uh, a multiple uh, smoke alarm. Well, the, these smoke detectors themselves are more advanced than what we were used to when we first started sure, seeing right. them in the business. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I first came on the department, it was very rare to see smoke detectors in houses. But all smoke detectors, including these, are good for 10 years. They have a 10-year life. The difference with these smoke detectors and CO detectors is that they have a 10-year battery life. So you might remember every year during Fire Prevention Month, and usually when we change the clocks again in the spring, we remind residents and homeowners to change the batteries in their smoke detectors. They won't have to do that with these detectors. Um, the difference between the detectors, there's basically three different kinds. There's the um, ionization detector, which detects a, a fast moving or flaring fire. There's a photoelectric detector that detects more of a smoldering type fire. And then there's of course the CO detector, which detects CO, which is a fairly common problem now that detectors have become more common in houses. Is there any kind of time frame that we need to make sure that people get a hold of you to qualify and get these smoke alarms uh, you know, installed? Mark, the sooner the better, really. Um, there, there is no real time frame other than the length of the program itself, which will expire in about, about nine months now, right. or a year and a half. Um, but the sooner the better, because the whole goal of this program is to educate people in one and two family homes, and also to get them protected. So here's the information again on how to arrange and getting a free safety inspection, which will include a free smoke and seal alarm if you're a Bristol resident. Don't go away. We're going to peek into Bristol's manufacturing past and then look into its future. Welcome to Bristol, 
Nestled in the heart of Connecticut, just two hours from Boston, New York, and an hour from the shoreline, Bristol offers a unique New England experience. City size with small town vibe, you'll fit in no matter your pace. As a community, we're rich with history, overflowing with passion, and ripe with experiences to enjoy. Beyond the rolling hills of Connecticut, that's where you'll find the magic of Bristol. With an incredible 700 plus acres of park systems, inspiring museums and cultural programs, and the oldest operating amusement park in North America. Our arts and entertainment will color you convinced. And local food and drink establishments to keep you excited, satisfied, and always savoring more. Community events that leave a lasting memory. We really do have it all. Plus, we're a community that honors the brave. A community that offers top tier sports and recreation. And world class accommodations to suit every style. But what if you wanted to stay even longer? Well, there's neighborhoods to pair with any personality. And places for all kinds of producers. Top rated school systems. Ways to make an impact. And plenty of places to worship. So whether you're vacationing, passing through, or staying a little longer, bring your heart to Bristol. Our heart is always open to your experiences. Bristol, Connecticut. All, All heart. heart. Looking at Bristol's history begins and ends with manufacturing. Known as a leader in manufacturing early clock parts, Bristol is now famous for manufacturing all types of components for all types of industries. This is where names such as the Barnes Group, Raleigh Springs, and countless others began their heritage, which continues today. There are over 13,000 open manufacturing jobs just in Connecticut. There are many people working together in Bristol today to ensure this heritage continues. One is the Central Connecticut Chambers of Commerce. Its president and CEO is Cindy Bombard. Cindy, you've lived in this area your whole life. You know as well as anybody that Bristol was really kind of built on manufacturing, but it really isn't history, is it? We still have a lot of good growing companies in town, don't we? Oh, absolutely. Some of the um, manufacturers that have been back in the 50s are still here today. Um, they may have changed a little bit, um, you know, technology-wise, but they're still in existence. You know, what's interesting, too, is, is that there's about 13,000 jobs in the state of Connecticut just in manufacturing that are going unfilled. You know, that's a great problem to have. So a as far as the Chamber's concerned, what are some of the things that, uh, I know you're very involved in NESMA, so maybe talk a little sure. bit about that and some of the other things the Chamber is doing to help the companies and the people of Bristol. Certainly, NESMA stands for New England Spring and Metal Stamping Association and actually it was started back in 1954 by some of the forefathers that own the, the companies, Associated Springs, Jumco, just to name a few, and it's still very lively. It's 77 company members strong. Um, member That's company-wise, member-wise, people-wise, it's in the hundreds um, in this Bristol arena, and they are all looking for the skilled workforce. So the Chamber of Commerce works very closely with NESMA, and we've created a technical advisory council which is made up of some of those manufacturers, our local educators through the public school system, the tech school systems, the community college, and now the universities. Because our job as a Chamber of Commerce is to put the pieces of the puzzle together. You know, and what's good is you or Katie, the marketing person mm -hmm. at the Central Chamber, comes to the Bristol Marketing Committee meeting on Friday, and you kind of always keep this in front of us as well. I think one of the very cool things that you've done this month was the, the job fair, yeah. which happened at the first of uh, this month. So tell us a little bit about that and uh, you know who was there and what was going on there. Certainly. Uh, the job fair came from listening to our employers and also listening to the schools and the colleges about kids can't find jobs or students can't find jobs and our manufacturers or the trades can't find the, the people to fill those. So again, we put the pieces of the puzzle together. We decided to create the job fair. We had 40 vendors come to that job fair and we had well over 500 individuals attend that job fair. From students, just to kind of take a look at career choices, from individuals looking for jobs or some of them for looking for job changes. 
We had companies that are local companies here um, from Southington Tool came in. You've got um, Atlantic Precision, which is a company here in Bristol. The Barnes Aerospace came, Associated Spring came. We even had Electric Boat come up from uh, the Groton area, as well as Stanley Black & Decker. That really shows the desperation of finding good people. And I think the misnomer is, is that a manufacturing job is grease, bad hours, no advancement. That, nothing could be farther from the truth, could it? No. So what we've done to eliminate that stigma of the manufacturing is we've opened up the doors to, to uh, the students to tour these companies and also bring our educators into into the workforce so they can kind of see what the, the newness of the companies do look like, um, which is, um, is, is great for the school to career coordinators, the guidance counselors, the teachers, because then they can go back into the school districts and they can talk to these students that want those types of jobs as a career opportunity. The key now is training a new generation of workers. One of the driving forces in Bristol to educating and then helping residents find the new lucrative manufacturing jobs is the Bristol Adult and Continuing Education Program led by its director, Larry Cavino. The first and foremost is if you want to get into manufacturing, you are going to need a high school degree. So that's the first thing that Bristol Adult Ed can help with. I try to stay away from the term GED adult high school diploma right. because GED is one of the options uh, where they're sitting and taking a test. There's the credit diploma, there's the national external diploma where they're working from home. Uh, but that first step is the high school diploma. From there, we also offer our students the opportunity it, with regards to resume writing and interview skills and the soft skills that any employer is going to be looking for. The biggest thing I hear from employers in Bristol is send me someone that knows an eight hour work day means you work for eight hours and a five day work week means you show up five days a week. On time. On time <laughs> and we'll train them. That's the key. Now we also have been offering our manufacturing programs which is a very basic introduction to manufacturing that goes over blueprint reading, um, mathematics skills that are common throughout the area. And the curriculum was actually put together by the manufacturers in the area themselves. Uh, they looked at it, they helped us write it, they signed off on it. And so that's key. So they know when a student has come through that program, they know what types of skills they're coming with. Uh, and that program includes right down to helping students complete a job application, prepping them for the interview, and in fact, helping them determine which company might be the best fit for them. I think the biggest fallacy is, is an old time perception of a manufacturing job is bad hours, bad working condition, no advancement, and poor pay. That just isn't the case now, is it? Oh, no, 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 no. Um, you walk onto any factory floor in this area, and I've been to a dozen of them, and it's as clean as what you would see in this classroom. It's not loud. It can get warm, but it's not. They have airflow systems. Um, it, it, it's completely different from what people imagine in the 70s. And especially, you know, I was in New Departure in the 70s, and it was loud, and it was dirty. It was, it was like hazy from everything, all the all the particles floating in the air, you won't see any of that. Uh, we also always tell our students who are considering manufacturing, look at the cars in the parking lot. Uh -huh. That's a key indicator. Manufacturing, and, and it's not just working behind a, a machine anymore. They, they need HR people, they need accountants, they need a variety of different people that can support the industry. They're clean jobs, they're great jobs, there's health care benefits. It, it really is a great place to work. Well, I, I think it's a great tribute to you and your staff about what you've done here because you said something key that I hope everybody paid attention to. You talk to these companies all the time, so they're asking your advice, and you can actually kind of recommend or at least make sure that they know about all the students here. Abs absolutely. The last two training programs that we've done, the majority of the students had jobs before they graduate. Wow. Because we reach out, we, we make sure that the area manufacturers know that we're running a cohort. 
We even invite them in to see the students in action so that if they're looking for somebody in a particular area, they'll email us and they'll say, hey, I need somebody in um, work a four slide to work a four slide machine. And we'll say, okay, we've got this individual that was excelling in that area. So we're gonna send them over to meet with you. Um, we develop a great relationship. The manufacturers recognize the fact that they need to go outside their comfort zone and work with other groups. And we've, ha we've had a great opportunity to collaborate with them. They've stepped up financially to support our programs as well as to send their trainers. So our folks are getting trained by people who are working in the industry. And that's key so that we know and we make sure that we're teaching the skills that literally they're gonna be able to walk out of our classroom and onto the factory floor. And it's not gonna be something that was from 10 years ago. It's gonna be up to date information. I think another thing that people should know about uh, the program out here is that you really go out and see a need. For example, there was a lot of openings in being a bank teller and then you went and designed the curriculum to help people become bank tellers and bank officials. Are you working with the manufacturing people as well to actually look at different courses and curriculum uh, to get in the program? Absolutely. They, they look at our curriculum on a regular basis um, to make sure that it's the most up-to-date for what they need. They also come and sit in on the interviews when we're interviewing people for the program. We will have manufacturers here because it, we're educators. So what we think could be a great person that could fit the mold for a manufacturer, we may not be correct every time. So we've invited the manufacturers to come in or to send their HR people to come in and sit in on their interviews with us. Um, our last cohort, the women in manufacturing, we were supported by Beakley Corporation, by DeCruz Manufacturing. Um, both of them sent over some of their folks to talk with our women that were in the training program to help us through uh, the interview process and the vetting process for folks so that we put our efforts toward the best group. The banking wa was key, and, and I have to give a shout out, Thomas and Savings Bank really were the ones that supported us with regards to that. The banking, the bank teller curriculum was set by them. They sent us their people to do the training with our folks it was so this is modern this isn't a textbook that you did 10 years ago this is no. like today's bank this is today this is today to the point that thomas and savings bank was able to get us into the corporation that's not too far from here that handles all the online banking pieces for the majority of all the banks in this area so our students were able to go over there about six at least six times and work on their terminals through practice programs that they had so that when they went into the bank, the terminal that they were going to be working on looked very similar to the one they were trained on. Um, and that, that was a phenomenal collaboration as well. And really, that, that's the key to all of this, is we see the chamber, we see Main Street, we see the city of Bristol, we see the Board of Ed, we see the manufacturers all collaborating to help make these training programs possible. Um, again, I go back to that, we're the educators. We're not in manufacturing, we're not in banking, but when everybody comes to the table, when I know I can pick up the phone and say, I need somebody to come over and do some mock interviews with some of our students. I get, I get people email me, within an hour I get a dozen people that will, I'll come over for a half hour, I'll come over for an hour and sit and interview folks. That's really, I think, the most unique thing um, that, that I have found. Just so satisfying, gratifying is everybody's coming together in support of our students and of these unique programs. It's easy to see the program's success. Here are a few of its graduates who are now prospering in Bristol companies manufacturing components for industries around the world. Uh, adult Ag really helped me there because I could take night classes and work during the daytime. And Larry, Jackie, they all, everybody there, they're real nice people and they helped me get to where I needed to be. Once I graduated, I ended up getting a job through Raleigh Spring and Stamping. Um, 
and it helped me get to where I needed to be really you know I'm only 20 years old and I, I have a seven month old son that I have to take care of and honestly it was probably one of the best decisions I ever made. I want to continue learning and this company has encouraged me to not only stop here but to continue furthering my education. I eventually want to go into CNC programming right. so um, and they helped me out here and um, they gave me the tools to succeed. Picking this as a career, I recommend and would recommend it to any woman so, to go out there and get it done. <laughs> the environment's clean, it's not too loud. Definitely don't go home dirty or anything. Um, every part that I work on is different. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good job and you know, it's close to home, so we don't got to travel far either. Well, I like that it's, it's not monotonous. Um, every, every day is a little bit different. I like working with my hands. A lot of the stuff we make is for aerospace or automotive, so um, basically, you know, the parts could be used all over the world. For more information on manufacturing training, check out the Bristol Adult and Continuing Education Center or Bristol at Tunxis or Bristol Tech. Well, we took a look at Bristol's past, present, and a glimpse into the future. I hope you enjoyed it. And we really appreciate you joining us each month on Uniquely Bristol. We'd like to know what you think, or maybe a story idea. Our email is marketing at bristolct.gov. And if you want to know more about Bristol, the best place to go is bristolallheart.com. And of course, we're on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. That's it for this edition. Enjoy the season, and we'll see you next month.